greetings uh, and warm welcome to the panelists and uh, attendees here in this webinar from India and also viewers from Australia and as well as the uh, rest of the world for this today's interesting webinar. And uh, we thank the panelists from uh, Australia to, to take this webinar on behalf of uh, Government of India's uh, initiative. And today's interesting webinar will be uh, handled by Mr. Paul Kenworthy and uh, his colleague Daniel Stannard, both from Australia National Coordination Bureau. And this webinar has been organized by National League Governance Division, Digital India, Ministry of Electronics, on behalf of, uh, departments of uh, Department of Defense Production, Government of India. In furtherance, uh, my colleague uh, Bhumika will uh, organize this webinar and provide requisite uh, housekeeping rules and also assist the speakers and the participants. Thank you very much and we welcome you one more time. Over to you, Bhumika. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hello, good afternoon, namaste. A very warm welcome to all our Indian and as well as international participants. My name is Bhumika Suri. I am from the National E-Governance Division, Digital India, and I'm here to take you through this exciting series of free event webinars being held as part of the Aero India Show 2019. We are very proud to be part of this first ever series of webinars by Aero India in collaboration with NEGD Digital India to disseminate knowledge by our esteemed speakers on such real civil aviation topics. Uh, before we begin, I will now take you through this, uh, through certain housekeeping rules. So as you know, this webinar would last at around uh, uh, for one hour and it will finish at around 4 p.m. Indian Standard Time. I will request all the panelists and the speakers to switch off their mics and shut, shut their cameras when they're not speaking. There is a chat option available at the down window uh, with you. You kindly share your comments, any concerns about your audiovisual settings, if there are any. We also have a Q&A section, so you can post all your question and answers in this Q&A section. Uh, we will take up the questions uh, at the end of the session. There is also a poll at the end. Uh, after the Q&A session, a poll will be flashed. Kindly rate us on the quality of the webinar in this poll. There is also live you stream, uh, YouTube streaming going on. We will share the link shortly. And also the videos would be available post the webinar on the YouTube, uh, YouTube channel, Digital India Learning Channel. Thank you. Uh, now I will hand over to Brigadier Arora to further introduce our eminent speakers for today. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Bhumika. Dear viewers, on behalf of Air India, I welcome you to the webinar series being held in the days as we build up to the Aero India show. Today is the fourth webinar in this series. This webinar is going to be different as our speakers shall be addressing the viewers from the cities of Melbourne and Canberra in Australia. Let me introduce our speakers. Firstly, we have Mr. Paul Kenworthy, an alumnus of prestigious Mona University, Melbourne. He is the current head of the Australian National Codification Bureau under the Capability Acquisition and Sustainment Group of the Australian Department of Defense. He is also the Australian representative on the NATO Allied Committee, which is the main group of National Directors on Codification, AC135. Mr. Kenworthy has nearly 40 years of experience in the highly specialized field of codification. He also served as the first non-NATO chairman from 2012 to 2016 of the NATO AC135 Panel A, which is a technical subcommittee. In addition, he has served for over nine years as the chairman of the Pacific Area Cataloging Seminar, PSCS, a forum which promotes the understanding and use of codification by the armed forces in the Indo-Pacific region. During the presentation today, Mr. Paul Kenworthy will be assisted by his colleague, Mr. Daniel Stannard. Daniel is also from the Australian National Codification Bureau. He is an alumnus of University of Southern Queensland. Mr. Daniel too, has a very vast experience in codification. And as I stated earlier, he will be joining us from Canberra for today's webinar. 
Now, having introduced the speakers, let me acquaint our viewers with today's webinar's topic, which is the benefits of NATO codification for the industry and the armed forces. Codification is key to cataloging and thus standardization. It forms the basic language of communication amongst various stakeholders, that is the armed forces and the arms industry and others supporting them. Codification ensures that each unique item in the military supply chain, irrespective of its origin, carries an identity in form of a unique code, thus providing a common methodology or language of military supply chain as it is known. This also paves the way for collaboration between various stakeholders, including the logisticians within the armed forces, as also lays the foundation for joint operation logistics amongst armed forces of different countries. NATO codification system is a scientifically designed system which has matured over the years and has been adopted by a large number of countries, India being one of them. During the course of webinar, our subject experts shall discuss the benefits of NATO codification for the industry and the armed forces. With this, I invite our speakers to address the viewers. Over to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Brigadier, for those kind words. G'day, namaste from Melbourne, Australia. Um, I will lead off on this presentation on the NATO codification system. Normally, this uh, talk would go over about two days. Uh, however, Daniel and I uh, have uh, compressed it into about 40 minutes. So we will try and talk slowly. We will try not to use acronyms. Unfortunately, in defense, we tend to overuse acronyms quite a bit. So we've tried to uh, simplify the presentation for industry. Uh, we see how we go. So I asked Daniel to, Daniel will be driving this uh, presentation for me. So he will change the slides. Thank you. Just loading it now. Thank you. The Brigadier introduced the, uh, the topic. As, as he said, I am in Melbourne, Australia, and Daniel is in Canberra, our national capital. Thanks, Daniel. Next slide. Just to let you know a little bit about the geography of Australia, the NCB is mainly situated in Melbourne. Uh, the capital of Victoria. Uh, Daniel is in Canberra, our national capital. He's there by himself. Canberra is also the site of our defence headquarters and the site of most of our major acquisition projects, which is why Daniel is there, specifically to talk to those big projects. We also have codifiers, uh, two codifiers at an Air Force base in Williamtown near Newcastle, New South Wales. We also have one codifier at the Air Force Base in East Sale in Victoria. So we have about, in total, 19 staff at the NCB and five contractors. Most of them are in Melbourne. Thank you. Most of the audience will realise that uh, recently we have been playing cricket in Australia against arguably the number one best team in the world, India. Uh, congratulations, India. Uh, you had the very first series win uh, by an Indian team in Australia, 2-1. Congratulations. Uh, I was praying for rain for the last two weeks, but we didn't get enough. So congratulations on a fantastic win uh, by Virat Kohli and his team. Next, please. As the Brigadier stated, the... Uh, NATO codification system is uh, governed by a NATO committee, AC135. It is made up of all the NCBs of the 62 participating nations, and that committee is AC135. It reports to CNAD, CNAD. It is the Conference of National Armaments Directors, so it is basically the two or three star responsible for uh, equipment in the armed forces 
and they report, CNAD reports to the North Atlantic Council is the political level at NATO. Thank you. The uh, Brigadier mentioned that we are a global system. So even though it's called the NATO codification system, it is in fact a global system, as you can see from this chart, uh, North and South America, certainly Europe, Scandinavia, uh, North and South, uh, South Africa. It is uh, quite widespread through the Indo-Pacific region, you know, Japan, Korea, South Korea, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, New Zealand, Australia. And as you can see there, uh, India, a very important uh, new player in the NCS. Thank you. Just to give a slightly different uh, chart, this is the, uh, the members of the NCS. You have uh, the NATO countries at the top. There are 29 NATO, NA uh, NATO members. Uh, and then we have 33 non-NATO members. So we actually have more non-NATO uh, participants than NATO. The sponsored nations are split into two groups, tier two and tier one. Just a very simple explanation. Tier one countries are not full uh, participants in the NATO system. They can only receive data. And NATO countries and the tier two are not allowed to use their NSNs. However, the tier two nations are full members and uh, technically they are full members and uh, we c they have two-way data exchange. In other words, if, uh, if uh, the USA is buying Australian equipment, uh, they will get Australian NSNs for that equipment if they need them. Next, thank you. So what is codification? Basically, it resulted from, as you know, with logistics, uh, very boiled down to a very basic uh, understanding. It is about good supply. And what is good supply? It is about getting the right part to the right place at the right time. And these days, it's also, I would suggest, at the right price or the lowest possible price. Uh, coming out of the uh, confusion of the Se Second World War, uh, the supply chains at the time, certainly in the US and other countries, uh, really did suffer under uh, the weight of equipment being purchased and transported. And uh, it was quite chaotic and uh, quite a big mess. So basically, the uh, president, president at the time, Roosevelt, uh, in January of 1945, requested that procedures be examined to improve goods management for the efficient pursuit of war, as well as for business in peacetime. So coming out of that uh, out of that request, that study, came the federal catalogue system. This system is used and still in use across uh, government, federal government in the USA. Coming out of that federal catalogue system, uh, initially the US invited the UK to join as an international partner. They later asked Canada and Australia, Australia to join in the early 1950s. And, and in about the mid-50s, uh, NATO uh, joined as well, and the system became the NATO codification system. Thank you. So again, the Brigadier gave a good introduction about what the system's about. I'll just reiterate that it is a positive, accurate, and complete information system ensuring the technical identity of each item so that it cannot be confused with any other item, item of supply. So its main purposes uh, are to establish a common supply language throughout all logistics operations, to enable interoperability, and to reduce costs by minimizing duplication of inventories. Thank you. I'm rushing a bit through here, but uh, I need to get through. So, what the NCS does, it creates a single language of logistics, a common supply language. So within industry, as you know, companies uh, have many ways to identify their items. Uh, they have multiple names, multiple manufacturers, and uh, multiple part numbers. So there's no standard way of doing things in industry. They do it for their own purpose, usually, um, and different sectors uh, do it in different ways. Within the armed forces these days with the NCS, we have a common system 
It's global, it is standardized, and it starts with the item name. So that common supply language, irrespective of language, uh, uses a standard way of naming based on the uh, a US system. And so for an item of supply, we will only have one approved name. So here we have a washer flat. And at the end of the process, going through classification and identification, we will end up with one NATO stock number, as you can see below. Thank you. So to understand the NCS, you really need to understand the difference between an item of production, an item that is uh, produced by industry and supplied by industry, versus an item of supply, which is basically how we manage items in our defence inventory. What we codify is, in fact, an item of supply. And what that represents is a user requirement. Someone has a logistics need and that is what we identify with an NSN. We then go out to find, we go out to industry to find what they are making and see if there's any, anything there that meets that uh, requirement. And we add that information to the NSN, for instance, manufacturers part numbers. So here is a, just a, a simple example of a, a light bulb, 220 volts, 60 watts, it has a screw connection. Now that, in the NCS will only get one NSN. In industry, it is produced by many manufacturers. It will have uh, many different part numbers, uh, but we only in defense will have one stock number and it will have the same fit form and function. Thank you. Just another uh, chart showing you that there can be multiple uh, manufacturers of a simple uh, tire. You can see there many manufacturers, different part numbers, but within the armed forces, the services, Army, Navy, Air Force, or between countries, if you have the same uh, requirement for a tire that has the same form fit function, you will be assigned a single stock number, an NSN. And you are not to assign another NSN to that item. You can only have the one. So if you have the same requirement, you must adopt that existing NSN. You are not to create a new NSN. Thank you. Here's just an example of the item of supply uh, and the item name code. Every name has assigned to it uh, an approved item name code. And what that does is that when you are sending information back and forth between countries, you, uh, it is language independent. In other words, if we are adopting uh, an NSN from Germany, and I'm talking about Australia, when that information comes into Australia, the name and other records, which is all coded, will be translated into English. And that is very useful for our users, of course, most of whom don't speak German. Thank you. And again, the key codes to remember, I call this master data. These are things that we create in the NATO system from information provided by industry is the NATO commercial and government entity code. The acronym for that is NCAGE, N-C-A-G-E. So I will talk about this quite a bit. That is a code, a five digit code given uh, by an NCB to companies. And if a company wants to do business with defense and, and have an NSN or the information against an NSN, then they will need an NCAGE. And Daniel will explain this a little bit better later, in more depth. Against that NCAGE, uh, we put the company's part number and that sits under the NSN. And again, the NSN, just quickly to explain uh, what that is, the uh, NATO stock number, 13 digits. The first four digits are the NATO supply classification. First the group and then the class, the first two digits of the group, then followed by th uh, third and fourth position is the class. The fifth and sixth position is called the NCB code. This denotes the NCB uh, that first codifies the item. It should be codified in the country of the original manufacturer. 
That's if you are a participant in the NATO system. Otherwise, it is the NCB of the first procuring country. That is for NATO and the tier two nations. And the last seven digits are a non-significant number. However, when it is added to the NCB code or the nation code, that then becomes a unique number. And once assigned, it can never be reassigned. These codes are the basis of our logistic system quality. And we call this the master data. And these are the keys against all the other data that we add to throughout the supply chain and throughout our systems are added to. Thank you. This is just some of the information that sits under an NSN. Uh, obviously, I talked about the name and the classification. Uh, there are reference numbers from logistics, also from industry, government, could be a government spec or standard. Generally speaking, it must have a, a primary reference from the manufacturer, the design control, that is. Uh, but of course, it also must have supplier uh, part numbers as well. It must have a, uh, normally we like, like it to have a technical description. We describe it in the same format around the world according to its form, fit and function. It also has uh, information, as I said before, about companies, company data, the name and address, for instance, the part number. And uh, it gives a, a fair bit of other information as it goes through the supply chain. Logistics management data, Generally speaking, most countries do not exchange this, but certainly with US data, you do get uh, some uh, supply, supply management data, but most countries do not exchange that. Thank you. Again, the benefits for defense, uh, this is a very short um, presentation. So as I explained before, if you use the NCS properly, you will create what we call a common supply language. These, this information we create uh, is master data and is essential for the work in the armed forces in logistics. And what it does is we identify a requirement. Just back to the other one, please. Previous slide, just haven't quite finished, thank you. <laughs> I think it's, it's jumping around. There we go. So we codify a requirement, a user requirement, and that is done on form, fit and function. Now, if you look down the left side of that column there, this is the role of the codification record within the logistic supply system. That is what codifying does for you. What impact does it have on the logistic support system? As you can see there, if you go down the col column, it assists with interoperability, it helps in the procurement of material. It helps in the decision making because you have up to date data and complete and comprehensive data to make your decisions, certainly for procurement or for standardization. You have a rationalized inventory, meaning that for a single NSN, you have multiple uh, items of production from different companies and you have alternate sources of supply. So for one NSN, you might have many different manufacturers and suppliers, although certainly in the aerospace uh, arena, you tend to have just a one-to-one -one relationship if there are air safety concerns, for instance. And lastly, on the right-hand side, you have the delivered uh, benefit. And uh, I won't go into that, but as you can see, it assists in multi -operation, uh, multinational operations. So for instance, disaster relief, it helps with a faster, better, cheaper logistics support system. It has secure and competitive supply from industry, multiple sources, and it gives new sales opportunities for industry. So most of these benefits are for the armed forces, of course. That's why the NCS was developed. However, there are uh, reasons why it is very useful for industry as well. Thank you. Next slide. Again, benefits for industry, I could just go through a few of them. It gives visibility to suppliers products in, electronic, uh, in an electronic catalog used in acquisition and uh, sustainment by 62 nations around the world. It allows suppliers to find out what nations around the world are buying and what their competitors are selling to governments. And with 38 million part numbers, 
uh, the NCS is a great place to search for spare parts. Thank you. And where, did, where is this information found? I just want to very, Daniel will go into this in a bit more detail, but I just want to mention uh, the NMCRL. It has a very long name. It's called the NATO Master Catalog of References for Logistics. This is a tool that is available to industry. It is basically, uh, it comes from the NATO database, which contains all the NSNs. So every NCB sends their, their own NSNs to, uh, to NATO, and it is uh, produced on this application or tool. It is available on the web. So you have the NMCRL web. There is also an offline version. And just to quickly go through this tool, which is available to industry, there are 17.3 million NSNs, over 38 million manufacturers and suppliers part numbers, and nearly 3 million uh, manufacturers and supplier details, company details. It is available via the web. It's updated daily. It's available in 16 languages, and you can do quite some good things with it. You can do batch uh, searches and jobs uh, like that, data maintenance. And Daniel will talk about this a little bit more. Uh, the NATO Mackerel web, the, sorry, the NMCRL web, uh, is available for industry. A uh, single license costs about 72,000 rupees. And a, for instance, one to five licenses, multi-use license costs about 92,000 uh, 92, rupee. Next, please. Again, what is very important with codification is that Industry is an important player in this because industry obviously has the data that we need to codify. So what happens in a major procurement uh, project for defence? Uh, we sit around a table. Uh, the people involved are normally the uh, project manager, program chief. Uh, we invite the, uh, the prime contractor or the manufacturer. We will have people from the armed forces, for instance, engineers, maintainers, uh, other logisticians, uh, uh, item managers, and we most importantly, we will have hopefully uh, someone from the NCB, a codifier who will sit there. This is the job of Daniel Stannard. He works in Canberra. He goes to these meetings all the time. And it's very important for him uh, that he tells not only defence, but also the manufacturer, the industry, about the importance of codification do you want to manage uh, this equipment in the supply system or through a, a commercial means? If you want to manage it in our supply system, in our supply chain, you must use NSNs. And so it's very important that if you want NSNs, you must put into contracts a codification clause that uh, requires companies, OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, to supply data, technical data, to the NCB so that we can properly codify the item. This is very important, and uh, Daniel will talk about this a little bit more. So this is, at that point, this is uh, uh, Daniel Stannard in Canberra will take over from this point. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Paul. So one of the key things that, uh, you know, as Paul sort of mentioned, is uh, part of my role is that I go out and talk to industry and talk to projects about why we want specific data and for codification and why it is actually so important for defence uh, and industry to work together so well. And I'd just like to spend a couple of seconds talking about defence logistics information. So defence logistics information is completely different to what commercial industry uses. Defence, by its nature of, of what we do, operates in a variety of harsh environments and sometimes simultaneously. So we could be using a one set of equipment, uh, say, you know, in a desert environment, in a hot sun, uh, very uh, uh, high temperatures. At the same time, a very, the, the same equipment, um, obviously not the same physical assets, but you know, the same equipment in a, in a different use, unit, could, for example, be used in uh, Arctic environments. So our equipment gets used in a lot of different environments, sometimes simultaneously, 
And therefore, we need to know a fair amount about that e equipment that we're using and uh, its characteristics, because that helps us plan um, our obsolescence and our repairs, etc. We are often work in very limited communications environments, uh, which means that a lot of our data, you know, we can't use, you know, huge uh, manuals or videos and things like that across networks. Um, and, and what that means is that in the codification system is we take the industry data and we actually can uh, textualize it so that um, it's more uh, portable within defense environments. We operate equipment for much longer than what industry does. Um, and we offer uh, often, sorry, um, oh, um, use this equipment for much lower utilization rates than what industry does. So uh, thankfully, most people would, would say is that you know, military aircraft, for example, don't fly anywhere near as much as what commercial aircraft does. So they have a completely different logistics uh, throughput than what the military does. We also op operate them for a quite a lot longer than what uh, domestic uh, airlines and, and the like would use. And that means that we come into more of an issue with diminishing manufacturing sources because we operate them for a much longer period. We don't um, you know, operate in, in a similar way to, to airlines where they you know, pump aircraft out day in, day out. We might have um, periods of time where we're not utilising the aircraft, for example, um, because there's no need. But then all of a sudden there might be a humanitarian uh, relief effort on and all of a sudden all hands are to the wheel and we need to get as, as many aircraft operating. So some, we often have uh, quite different utilisation rates and short times to change those utilisation rates. So it's not a standard um, across the board even um, use of our equipment. We need to have war stock because you never know what the future is. So we, we have strategic reserves and the like. So we need to know uh, how to store and manage equipment so that it's um, not perished whilst it's in store. And uh, of course, in, in that case, we, in that environment, we use just in case rather than just in time. So all of this feeds into what, what do we do for, with codification data and what do we need? So we were looking at all the necessary logistics information to safely ensure we get the right item, the right time, the right place, which is uh, what Paul has uh, alluded to throughout uh, his part of the presentation. We have a lot more legislation and regulation than what commercial industry does. So there's more things that we want to know about what's going on with uh, and what the equipment is made of. Of course, we operate in a worldwide environment. And as Paul's made a comment of, we want to use a common language understood by all. And because we do use equipment for a very long time, potentially even 50 years and, and in some cases longer, we actually need to know a lot about the equipment because in 50 years time, we might actually have to, well, we will have to go and dispose of it at some stage. So some very specific examples from Australia as to you know, where we've used codification data, just to give you a little bit of context as to, to why we want some of the data that we want. So, uh, in November last year, the Australian um, Regular Army, or the ARA as it is on the side, retired its Kiowa observation helicopters. These aircraft had been in service since 1971, so that's 47 years, and they're the same aircraft that we got in 1971. So we have to look after those aircraft for a much longer period than what commercial operators do. So our logistics information, which all centres around codification data, needs to be able to support us well into the future. So aircraft we're buying today may well still be in service in 2050. And that's a long time. At the bottom of the slide, you see Australian aid. That's an image of uh, our Defence Force personnel palletising Australian aid to go on a commercial aircraft. Now, Australian aid in this particular case comes from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. It's not even part of our department. But they use NSN so that when our military personnel go to deploy their um, aid, water um, and uh, food and generators and the like, where we have to go out and help uh, as part of humanitarian and disaster relief, we have all of the information that we need to know, its volume, its weight, um, any hazardous materials and the like, so that we can comply with IATA requirements and so that our um, military personnel who distribute this equipment can freely and easily 
um, place it on, on civilian aircraft uh, and to dispatch it when we need it. And, you know, these things happen very quickly, so we don't have time to go hunting for the information. So NSN information for this is really key for us so that we have the ability to rapidly deploy um, the equipment that we need to, all the supplies as it is in an Australian aid case. It helps us identify commonality. And one of the things that it can do for industry is also help commonality. So here you have three aircraft that are operated by our Royal Australian Air Force. The top one is a 737 um, uh, VIP transport. In the middle, you have a wedge tail aircraft, which is an airborne early warning uh, radar aircraft. And the bottom one is our new P8 aircraft. Looking at them, they look very similar. So you suspect, yes, there's some element of commonality. And items that are used across those aircraft have the one NSN and we had deploy that same NSN across all those uh, platforms. But one thing that you may not be, uh, may be surprised about is that there are components from those three uh, aircraft that actually fit in that mains battle tank. Right? The main battle tank has a gas turbine engine and it has a lot of electronics on board as well. And some of those components are common across those four platforms. One NSN, one item of supply, one logistics concept, one logistics need, right? uh, one NSN, all used across those four platforms. So how do we use in Australia, as, in, as a, from my example, uh, how do we use codification data to support our industry? And how can industry use this codification data in the way that you do things? So looking at it from the perspective, uh, from, from this example, we recently uh, worked with a number of projects that were building up uh, uh, support and test equipment kits. These kits were designed to support aircraft that the Royal Australian Air Force use. As part of the, the um, contract and the way that we do business at home here is that we have our industry review the NATO Master Catalogue of References for Logistics, the NMCRL, to see what NSNs already exist because that tells people what is the existing logistics support requirements of our department, of our Air Force, and what's being used around the world. So based on that NSN, you get the logistics need based on form, fit and function. An NSN gives, them, gives you information about what those items need to be qualified against. What standards do they need to be made? Is there an accreditation requirement? So looking at an NSN, you can see, based on the data, as to what the uh, item of supply needs to be certified against. It also contains information about the safety and environmental concerns, you know, whether it's um, able to contain or whether it contains uh, hazardous chemicals, whether it contains mercury or asbestos and things like that. What's the major composition, uh, composition of the items? Is it toxic? So those sorts of things are all uh, considered as part of the NSM. One of the things that we do with, with our projects and with our industry, and, and they use the NMCRL, the uh, References for Logistics, for, is to see what items are already in use. If we already have an NSN for screwdrivers or uh, monkey wrenches or uh, any other hand tools, for example, then we don't want another one. In fact, we're not going to get another one. But it says that we have a requirement for one and with all the information on an NSN, it explains what that requirement is. And if there is an NSN and Australia is already a user, then industry knows that we have a supply chain. It's a supply chain that um, shows where all of the suppliers are globally and can potentially allow for economies of scales because they can use that information to dovetail into other buys that are going on by other militaries and the like. And in Australia, we use a lot of industry support to actually do a lot of the purchasing and procurement and managing of our inventory. If we already have an NSN and we're, we're the user, then you know that there is a support chain already established for that item. We have a maintenance and repair process. We know how to package, handle, storage and transport, PHS and T. We have training, how to use it, how to store it, how to manage it. We have calibration processes in place and we have disposal processes in place. So by looking in the NMCRL, industry is able to see what does defence use 
what does government use in some places, and have an assurity that the items that are already in, in place and in use already have some of these support mechanisms set up. And that means you don't have to go and do it again. There's no point reinventing the wheel. NSN information also includes things about you know, customs and procurement and uh, some of the United Nations requirements as well. So there's a tre treasure trove of information that is stored in the NMCRL that is very useful for industry. The NMCRL also allows for uh, linkages to other uh, classification systems such as GS1. So let's have a look at another example of how information of, of codification information can be used to help industry. And this, I understand you won't be able to read all the details, but have a look in the Bangalore mirror. Uh, you will certainly find this uh, um, article and uh, we'll provide web links as well um, at the end of the presentation. But this is actually from the last Aero India. And this is an example where a Indian company is now able to sell uh, the tyres that they manufacture in India to the, um, for some reason the PowerPoint presentation went backwards, um, and apologies for that, uh, an Indian manufacturer able to look at the codification data was able to determine that the product that they made, in this case is the tyres, actually met a logistics need. And that logistics need was through the United Kingdom for the Hawk aircraft. So the NMCRL can be very useful for industry to determine what the logistics requirements are of, um, of militaries around the world and including some government agencies. Uh, for example, you know, AusAid in Australia uses, NM, uh, uses uh, NSN information as well. As so does a, a number of other countries have other government agencies who use it. So this is a very powerful tool. And as it says there on the sign, access to data is access to opportunities. And that's a great example with the, the tyres for the Hawk aircraft. The NMCRL and, and it, uh, contains all the information about NSNs. And NSNs have reference numbers and cage, num cage codes. And the NATO Commercial and Government Entity, or NCAGE, is the code that we use to identify suppliers and manufacturers. Paul mentioned it a little bit earlier through, through the presentation. It's a unique identifier for an entity, whether it be a supplier or a manufacturer or a government agency. It can be linked to, your, to a GLIN, which is uh, linked with GS1. They're free. They don't cost anything to, to, to get, and any com company can have one. They are self-managed via the NCAGE tool, which is hosted by the uh, NATO Support and Procurement Agency on the NATO website. And there is a link to the specific page in regards to uh, the AC135, the Allied Committee responsible for codification, and the, the specific information about NCAGES is on this uh, page. We've spoken a little bit about the NMCRL, and the NMCRL is a very powerful tool for industry, and it allows significant information to industry about what the militaries of the world are procuring and what we use. And it is a, a, a really important tool for our industry, and we would like you to consider um, purchasing a, a, a access to it. But before you jump in boots and all and, have a, uh, and, and buy a subscription, there is the offer here today for having a, uh, access to the NMCRL on the web through a light version. And it allows you to discover what the NMCRL looks like, what it contains, how it can help you as a business for a one month trial. There's a link at the very bottom of the page and we'll make sure that it's also available uh, through the uh, information for the presentation. So we'd like to encourage uh, companies out there to uh, take up this one month trial, have a look and see what the NMCRL can do for you because we believe that it can significantly improve the way uh, and, and pr provide business opportunities for you. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. The, um, the web link to uh, the NATO codification system is here on the last slide. Paul and I will now spend a few minutes uh, going through the questions and answers, uh, going through the questions for you and so providing some answers. 
So if you uh, just give us a moment and I'll bring up some questions, let's bring up the questions. We have uh, seven uh, on the system at the moment. If there are others that you would like to ask us, please do. Um, we have the remainder of this presentation uh, I've set aside for, for questions and answers. So, um, uh, Paul, we have a question here that uh, you might like to answer. Uh, is a NIN unique only within a NSC or is it unique across all NSCs? It helps if you unmute the, uh, <laughs> the microphone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Paul. Okay. The, uh, the NIN is unique. Uh, the thing with the, uh, the classification system is that even though you may uh, assign one for the NSN, it can change. And so you have to be very careful in industry. If, for instance, a manufacturer, you are making your item and putting the NSN on your item, that is not probably um, a good thing to do because an NSN may change in the sense that the first four digits may change. It doesn't happen too often, but it can happen. But the last nine digits, the NIN, that is unique and that will never change. And cool. the classification, the first four digits are related to the name, uh, so not, not the NIN. If that was the meaning of the question, uh, I'm not too sure, but uh, I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you, Paul. I think that that uh, does. If uh, the person who asked that question has further uh, wants further clarifications, we can provide uh, answers afterwards. Um, this one's specifically for you, Paul. What are your views on linking NSNs with a commonly used commercial product identifier such as a GTIN or the former EAN under GS1 systems of standards? Thank you. I think I saw that question come in from Enzo Blanc. Thank you, Enzo. <laughs> Hopefully it's not raining in uh, Brussels. Uh, good question. There is huge opportunities uh, for our global system of item identification to utilise uh, the commercial standards. Now, in industry, one of the most common commercial standards, one of the most successful, is the GS1 uh, barcodes for items. I, I consider barcodes as uh, super references, and I think there is a great opportunity for the NATO system to link the NSN to the uh, to the GS1 number, G10, the GTIN, and that is something that uh, AC135 is looking at at the moment. We are creating a, a new field in the NATO system that will actually help us link the two codes together. And that linkage will appear on the NMCRL. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, just give me a second. We don't have too many questions today, which either means Paul and I have answered all of your questions, um, or people are a little bit, uh, a little bit shy. Um, I'd ask instead of raising your hands, if you could actually. Uh, type in the Q and A's. It makes our uh, life that little bit uh, easier. Um, uh, Daniel, I, uh, there's one question at the bottom of the screen that was: uh, uh, Doesn't it mean that across the NCS we'd only be limited to nine, nine, nine? That is seven times nine NINs. So, how are we going to overcome this particular aspect? Can I answer that one, Daniel? That that question is a good one, except uh, no country has ever uh, gone over their uh, allocation of the nine-digit number, except for the United States. The United States has by far the, the biggest inventory, and uh, they use the NCB code 00 and 01. So, uh, and they still have a fair way to go. I think they actually have the first nine codes. I think 00 through to 09, I think, maybe 02. Uh, maybe to 10. Um, but certainly, I don't see any country running out of uh, codes for uh, many, many, many years. We've been using the system now for 60 years. And I can tell you, certainly in Australia, we are probably a couple of hundred years 
before we run out of numbers. And then we'll just possibly get a new NCB code. But uh, that is not, uh, not an issue. Daniel, anything to add? No, Paul, I think uh, you're quite right. And by the time we, you know, with the, the 62 countries that, are, that play in this space, get to the, the point of being overpopulated of NSNs, um, you know, we'll be flying cars and various other uh, modern things. So you would probably, uh, you know, we can always expand that out uh, beyond the 13 digits if required, you know, many, many years in, uh, in the future. Uh, remains that uh, when you are codifying an item and if for that form fit and function uh, a unique number has already been allotted by another country so you can utilize that number so that is where the major uh, reason which lies behind it that is why this number is not going to astronomically increase it is going to just incrementally increase over the period of time correct uh, uh, I think, are there any more questions from our viewers? They can quickly type out. Hello, everyone. Uh, I would also request all the participants, if they have any questions which they want to take live, please raise your hands and we'll allow you to speak. Only people with proper names uh, will be able to allow them. Uh, here, uh, remark is from Pewter. The, uh, that uh, NMCRL holds 17 million active NSNs, NINs today, and there is a space to add more. So he is the one who's looking at the NMCRL, and uh, he assures everybody that there is a space to add more. Then the uh, next question is as regards uh, Russian aviation spare parts and data. So this is uh, being codified as per the need of re respective uh, countries if they're holding these uh, spares in their inventory. So they're codifying them. The next question is there a unique number against one NCB code could also be utilized against another NCB code. Uh, Karthik Bajaj has asked this. So that I just uh, mentioned so. So when you are allocating a new code to an item, so you the process is a stringent and a rigorous one wherein it automatically eliminates the duplicates. And if you are a unique uh, form fit function, then a new number will be allocated uh, by the system, else you use an existing number. The It's it's a collaborative mode of uh, functioning wherein a number of an, an item which is in use in one armed force and if similar item is in use in another armed forces, they can use the same common number by uh, requesting the NCB or the country which has codified it first and adopt that particular uh, number by getting requesting for data from respective uh, countries uh, codification bureau. So uh, the item ideally gets codified only once, saving effort for others also. Uh, the Vivekanand Bose, Bose I think uh, says that for the Ind Indian industry, will the NCS be applicable only to US and NATO platform? We have or likely to have. Actually, it is not related to the US or NATO platform. It is the items in our respective countries' inventory, defense inventory. So we will have a unique code for our unique items in our defense inventories. And then uh, the next, uh, Peter has answered a particular query. Once item is codified, can industry submit add more technical data to help identification of item? And I, if you don't mind, I'll take this one, uh, Brigadier. Uh, and uh -huh. This is actually a, a very good question and it leads into a few things. So through the NMCRL web access that industry can um, uh, purchase, one of the things that, uh, we, that industry can do is actually uh, request the maintenance of, of their reference information and provide additional information about items that you supply us. So you have the ability to uh, add and, and uh, request modification of, of reference numbers. So let's say you make part a, a particular part that you've changed the part number or you've uh, made, uh, made some form of change and the part number um, has changed. Then as through the uh, web access, through that subscription service of the NMCRL, you're able to provide us with the information that we require to go and add 
that new reference information in and, and update those records. Um, so yes, industry absolutely is, is a part of this process um, throughout the life of an NSN. So you know, we, we are always trying to uh, improve the quality of, and, and the amount of information we have on every NSN. So industry very much is, um, is, is a part of that. And, and that uh, online access through the NMCRL uh, web access for industry actually provides a lot of uh, assistance to industry in maintaining uh, those reference numbers through um, you know, the various change processes that uh, industry have. So that's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, there are two more questions. One is, what is uh, local NSN? So uh, a local NSN is a temporary number uh, NSN created within the system. Uh, before, uh, uh, while the system is working out or you are working on the references, etc. So it can be temporarily created or an NSN which you don't want to share globally. So that both ways it uh, works. Uh, and the last question is, type three item identification procedure. So if you're asking that, so you, that means you already, it is well listed in the AC uh, Accord P1 manual. We can have an offline discussion on that. And next is, uh, is NSN useful for obsolescence, obsolescence management? Yes, NSN is useful for obsolescence management because uh, you continuous, you are able to look at your inventory and each item, it's if it is part of various other platforms, if an item can be useful in another platform, the uh, spare parts as a spare part or as a key component, then obviously the system will reflect that. Uh, uh, then the another question is, sir, the discussions of today explains multiple reference numbers against a single NSN. However, I've come across a few instances of multiple NSNs against a single reference number. Does that mean that there is still some duplication across the systems? Uh, if that appears so, then yes, that means there is an error on part of the codifier or when the data was updated. So that certainly needs to be corrected. Uh, it is uh, one, one to many relation, not many to one relationship, if I may say so. Uh, no clarify on updation. I really don't understand what is the query. Uh, any, just scroll down, please. Are uh, standards like DIN and ISO related to NSN quality? Okay. Actually, um, uh, NSN is a number. It's a number allocated to a particular item having same form fit function. The data standards uh, which were evolved while evolution of the NATO codification system have been adopted by various ISO and uh, data storage and data handling data processing standards by the ISO. And it has given way to many, uh, many standards in the ISO, which form basis of other large directories or dictionaries, uh, which have been used. But by far, uh, NSN and NATO codification system is more suited for the military logistics as it pertains to specifically the military supply chain. Maybe uh, Paul or Daniel can add to it. Daniel? I was actually gonna say Paul. <laughs> would you <laughs> like to type that one? Okay, uh, here I would like to come in and I would uh, request uh, Paul and Daniel, would you like to take any live questions so we can allow some uh, people to talk and put up their questions verbally? Yes, certainly. Yeah. Omkar, I'll be taking up your question. I'm allowing you to speak. Okay. Hello? Hello? O Omkar, can you hear us? I don't think he can speak uh, right now. So any other questions, any other attendees uh, who have raised their hands? Yes. Okay, Karthik Balaji is there. I'll allow you to talk. 
Hello? Karthik. Uh, yes, ma'am, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, please put up your question. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Lieutenant Commander Karthik Palaji from uh, the AHSP for Naval Aviation. And uh, I was the one who had asked the question regarding the uh, regarding whether there can be multiple unique numbers <coughs> across across different NSCs. Uh, the, the reason for my with, I've been uh, it's been clarified because that uh, that it is unlikely that any one country will reach that figure that magical figure of nine million nine hundred and ninety nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine. However, uh, does that mean that the uh, that so that was the reason for my question uh, regarding whether the same unique number, the seven-digit unique number, whether that can be duplicated across two uh, NCB codes. That means that if you have say zero zero, which is called the US NCB, uh, zero zero and seven, six zeros and one, could you also have a seven two and six zeros and one? Thank you for that question. Uh, yes, you can. So that last seven digits are non-significant. So every NCB uh, uses those numbers. Uh, usually the system uh, gives those out sequentially, but when it's put with the NCB code, the nation code, it becomes a significant number. In other words, it's unique. So the nine digits is unique. The last seven digits are not unique. So uh, any other questions, anyone you want to take them live, uh, please raise your hands. Uh, just this last question, uh, can you flash it? How the NSNs ensure at 100% the airworthiness of aircraft and the authority to fit uh, principles? Actually, the NSNs will provide uh, a visibility of unique codes for unique type of items which are similar in form, fit and function. The airworthiness part will possibly leverage this. The logistician will leverage this information to ensure that right part is available at the right place at the right time. So adopting in a sense helps us not only within an organization or within the uh, a country's armed forces, when we are part of joint uh, operations or multinational forces, we've taken our equipments there. There, it will certainly be of great help if you use NSN and the other country is also using NSN. Then uh, we can exchange the part list. We can exchange parts, the availability at the nearest logistics hub to ensure availability of the right kind of part at the earliest, cheapest, and swiftest mode availability. So that is how you will... Uh, ensure airworthiness of your platform or serviceability of any other platform. It will be aware, applicable across the world, across other platforms also. Paul? I don't have much to add. Daniel might, might want to add a little bit. Normally, authority to fit, uh, as you say, the uh, NSN data is very, very useful for that. Um, however, normally authority to fit is done in a separate system, of course, and normally it is uh, based around a, uh, a single part number. Normally, for instance, you would not you would want to put a Boeing a Boeing part number uh, on a Boeing jet, not something you buy down the local shop. Um, there's a very good reasons for authority to fit airworthiness uh, considerations. In that case, the NSN can be restricted to a single part number. This is done uh, very easily, and the N N uh, the uh, NATO codification system can handle this extremely well. So. Uh, it does work. Daniel may want to add something to that. Yes, thank you, Paul. And 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 you, Paul, you're entirely right. The codification system, you, keeping in mind that an NSN relates entirely to a logistics requirement, a logistics need of the of, of the military, and we can narrow that down so that it is such that it's only a single part number or maybe uh, a, a single manufacturer's part number, maybe one or two suppliers. And we can say, you know, maybe a, a, if, if a fourth supplier came on, we're not really um, sure about the provenance of those items, we can ensure that they don't get added onto the NSN. So the NSN being a logistics need absolutely can assist with uh, that provenance requirements for aviation safety. That's a very good question. 
Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Brigadier Sir. Also, uh, I would here mention that uh, not everybody has given us the rating. Please uh, mark the poll and please give us, uh, please rate us on the quality of the webinar. And any more questions? I uh, any more people who want to put up their questions? Okay. Can I just can I ask a question myself? <laughs> it's not a question; it's a please, statement. Please, please I just go would ahead. like. I would like to um, uh, just say to the brigadier that uh, I congratulate India on attaining Tier Two status in the NATO codification system. This is a huge step for India. Uh, congratulations, India has passed all the NATO tests. Their system. Uh, which is the, uh, the German COT system, uh, NCOR. Uh, the organization, the data, uh, the processes have all been checked. Uh, India has passed. It now, India can now participate at the full level of a tier two nation. So, uh, Brigadier, congratulations. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, we definitely look forward to working uh, with uh, you and the other NCBs as a tier two nation in future. Thank you so much. And the hard work begins from hard the 1st of, Feb first of February. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So I think uh, there being no more questions, I thank uh, both our speakers, uh, Paul and Daniel, who assisted him for uh, coverage of the topic. Uh, it was an extremely lucid uh, presentation and uh, I think uh, viewers will be greatly benefited by this particular talk. The, uh, I also take this opportunity to thank the other colleagues at the Australian NCB and Australian Armed Forces for the assistance in this regard. And I thank again uh, the Australian NCB for having conveyed its best wishes to us on having attained the tier two status. So I, in the end, uh, wish to thank NEGD for their technical support and call upon our viewers to join us for next webinar on 17th of January at 15 and hours on another interesting topic. Over to you, Bhumika. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And thank you, Paul and Daniel, for so, such an informative, educative session. Uh, I hope you have rate, rated us on the webinar quality. Also, now let me share my screen and you can all see the next webinar schedule. So as you see, the next webinar is scheduled on 17 January 2019, 3 p.m. 3 PM Indian Standard Time. Uh, it is on future battlefields. I would uh, request everyone to share this with others, your friends, your colleagues, so that they can attend this webinar. Also, all these webinars are available on YouTube, Digital India Learning Channel. Uh, the previous webinars as well as the future uh, webinars would be available. Now, let me take this opportunity to take you through the website of Aero India. So here you see the website and uh, the web, uh, Aero India show 2019 would be conducted from 20th February till 24th February this year. Here you see the webinar section. You have the registration, join webinar, and guidelines for webinar. When you click on join webinar, you see all the details, all the scheduled webinars, their links, and uh, the speaker information as well. So you can uh, come up here, choose the webinars, or see view all the webinars which have been conducted. The YouTube links have been provided. You can join the uh, webinar directly also from here. The links have been provided. Also, if you have any issues, you have the guidelines available here and you can go through the guidelines. So uh, with the, uh, before I end, I would like to thank a lot of people. Mr. M.S. Rao, uh, President and Chief Executive Officer, National E-Governance Division. Dr. Ajay Kumar, Secretary, Defense Production. Sri Barun Mitra, Additional Secretary, Defense Production. Sri Vijendra joined Secretary Naval Systems and CVO DDP. Mr. Paul Kenworthy and Mr. Daniel Stannard for taking out time uh, for this webinar, even after India won the series. Uh, and Mr. Sunil and team at HAL.
for preparing the graphics and uh, other support. Last but not the least, the Digital India LMS team here at NEGD for making this webinar a success. Thank you all very much. With this, we now complete, uh, conclude today's webinar. Hope to see you again for our next webinar. Happy learning. Jai Hind.